Welcome to this Professor Messer Free CompTIA A Plus Certification Training Course Module on CPU Sockets. I'm your host, James Messer. And in this particular module, we're going to talk about the CPU sockets and how we can expect to see these show up on our A Plus exam. This will be on your A Plus Essentials exam, your 220-601, which talks about understanding those fundamental principles. So we'll need to be able to look at the socket that's on a motherboard for the CPU and understand more about what type of CPU goes in there, what type of socket it might be, and how those two things are associated with each other. So we're going to not only look at the old school dip type sockets and what those really consisted of, but we'll show you some of the slot sockets, some of which are even still used today. But mostly, we're using PGA sockets. So we'll certainly spend some time on those. The socket types themselves, when we go way back and we look at some of the very first personal computers that were ever created, we can see that the Intel 8088 processor was what we called a dual inline package. And that's because it had two sets of pins across it. And when you wanted to install one of these processors, you you essentially put it on the motherboard and you lined it up with what was on the motherboard. I think I have a picture of what one of those sockets looked like. This is the way the socket looks on the motherboard. This actually comes from an old token ring card that uses those types of chips as well. So you had to line the chip up exactly right and then push very carefully to have that chip go down into that, that motherboard or into that circuit board. And the problem was that if you were off by even a little bit, the pin would bend up. Now, hopefully, you were able to pull the chip off and bend the pin back down. But I really broke a lot of memory chips that way, trying to install them into those motherboards. Really wasn't the best way to go about installing a socket. Fortunately, when the Pentium 2 came out, we started seeing other types of technologies for CPUs. This particular CPU was contained within a single edge cartridge. This is a metal and plastic cartridge that surrounded the Pentium 2. Inside was this. It was the CPU itself. There's some cache memory. But you can see it's a, a relatively large sized CPU. And all of the pins at the bottom were on this single edge. And the cartridge simply slid right into the motherboard, the slot itself was called slot 1. And if you ever find any old Pentium 2s, you'll see that this big slot is right there on the motherboard. And when you plug that CPU in, you can see there it is plugged right into the motherboard. It just fits right in there. The, the CPU itself, very big and very long. And the, the blue fins that are on here are heat sinks because that Pentium 2 got really hot. And so the heat sinks were used to help dissipate some of that heat as the fan blew air uh, by that CPU by the entire motherboard. As Pentium systems evolved, as CPUs evolved, they gained a little bit different shape. And this is one that you'll see a lot these days. And it's a pin grid array. There's different kinds of PGAs, as we call them today. There's micro PGAs and other types of PGAs. But they all have this same type of pin grid array style, where the bottom of the Intel Pentium, for instance, this Pentium 3, the bottom of the CPU has all these tiny little pins sticking out. And the top of it just has no pins. There's nothing on there at all. And the way that we would use those sockets is we simply put them into what we call the zero insertion force uh, sockets on a motherboard. The zero insertion force module was used with these PGAs to be able to install a CPU onto a motherboard without putting any force on it whatsoever. You can imagine with having that many pins there in a system, if you were needing to install it onto a, a motherboard, you would probably need to push it very hard to make sure all of those pins went into a system. But with the zero insertion force modules, it became a situation where you put no force on it whatsoever. You use these arms on the side of the zero insertion force to, to have the arm raised up. You simply laid the CPU into those sockets with no force at all. And then you move that arm back down to lock it in place. And the CPU was then installed in the system. This way, we didn't put any force on the motherboard. And there was no opportunity to crack, to push, to put any additional stress on the system. There's a lot of very, very tiny components that are surface mounted and very small uh, traces that are on this motherboard. You don't want to crack those. You don't want there to be any problem with that. So the zero insertion force module make sure that we aren't putting any additional pressure on that motherboard whatsoever. In fact, zero force, as the name implies, to install a CPU on that system. 
In summary, you're going to see a number of sockets and processors combined together. You may be asked on your exam, how many pins can we expect to see on a socket 423? So this is a number of the most popular sockets and processors that are used on motherboards. You can see some are called slots, like that Pentium 2 at a slot 1. Happen to have 242 pins on it. Fortunately, these days, the sockets and the number of pins have exactly the same name. So a socket 370, it's got 370 pins on it. A socket 478 has 478 pins on it. Much easier to understand in those scenarios. But there are some relatively new CPUs that don't use sockets like that. They continue to use slots. And in that case, like a slot A for the AMD Athlon, it's one that has 242 pins, and it's that larger slot, very much very similar to what we saw with the earlier Pentium 2. So on the exam, you may be asked for a number of these different pieces. This is one of those, those tasks where you just need to memorize the number of pins and the different types of sockets. Probably not for every possibility of sockets. These are the most popular ones that you'll probably see on an exam. But it's nice to have that nomenclature available. And certainly, as you buy new systems, you install new motherboards, and you replace CPUs, you're going to want to see what socket is on that motherboard. And now you'll have a familiarity with what, how many pins that socket has and the type of CPU that goes into that system. In review, we've really gone through understanding the history of those different kinds of sockets, all the way from the dip and the slots, some that are even used today, to the more common PGAs of what we see with today's CPU technology. And you've seen, as a summary, the types of things you might be asked about on the a certification exam and the types of sockets that are most popular. If you'd like to leave a message on our message boards about this video, share some thoughts with other people, if you'd like to look at our discussions and our training course modules, additional videos, always go out to our website at freeaplus.com.